The sea can be very unforgiving. Down the centuries, there have been numerous tales of seafarers desperately battling the elements to save themselves and their ships. One such epic took place at the end of 1951, a year that had seen Europe casting aside the shadow of the Second World War. Germany was a country divided, with the eastern half firmly in the grip of Russian communism. West Germany, in contrast, was beginning to establish a strong economic base. It was at West Germany's principal port, Hamburg, that the story began. This was a time when the Atlantic Ocean was ravaged by storms the like of which had seldom been seen. On the 21st of December, the 6,700 ton American export is Bronson Line freighter Flying Enterprise left Hamburg bound for New York. She had a full cargo and 10 passengers. Her captain was 37 year old Kurt Carlson. He was a Dane who had become a naturalized American citizen during the Second World War. Carlson had sailed in numerous wartime Atlantic convoys and had been at sea since he was a teenager. Fog was present as Flying Enterprise nosed her way down the River Elbe, out into the North Sea, and then down through the English Channel. Far out in the Atlantic, however, a deep depression was moving rapidly eastwards and gale warnings were broadcast. On board Flying Enterprise, increasingly heavy seas meant that none of the passengers felt like eating the Christmas meal that the cook had prepared. During the night, the flying enterprise endured the increasing fury of the storm. But at seven o'clock the next morning, there was a sudden loud bang. The ship's hull had cracked amidships in two places and began to let in water. For the next 60 hours, the crew struggled with the pumps, but gradually the mountainous waves made her list ever further to port. Eventually, a tidal wave swept through the engine room and the ship came to a drunken halt. As the cargo shifted, the list increased to 30 degrees and more. Carlson sent out a Mayday message at 1 p.m. on Friday the 28th of December. Within a few minutes, the American freighter Southland answered. It would take her many hours to reach Flying Enterprise's position, 300 miles southwest of the Scilly Isles. Falmouth, England was the nearest port. Soon afterwards, the ship lurched to an angle of 45 degrees. The port rail was now below water, and the passengers were huddled in the passageways. It was impossible to restart the engines. Southland reached Flying Enterprise after dark and stood by all night. Come daylight, she launched her lifeboat, and the passengers were encouraged to jump into the sea. Only two did so, and so Carlson ordered crew members to jump with the other passengers. Even so, it took some 20 minutes to rescue everyone from the sea. By now, another ship, the American military transport General Greeley, had arrived. Carlson ordered the remainder of his crew to abandon ship. All were rescued except one sailor. Carlson, however, was determined to stay with his ship he was convinced that if a rescue tug were deployed in reasonable time, Flying Enterprise and her cargo could be saved. 
If she were salvaged without anyone on board, her owners would have to pay a large fee to get her back. If she were lost at sea, then it was the insurers who would suffer. Thus, he considered that it was his duty to remain on board. He was relieved, however, by the knowledge that the passengers and crew had been rescued. As far as I know, there were no serious casualties. One of the women got a shock, but outside that, everything went fine and dandy. But, uh, as I say, after 23 years at sea, I guess we had a coming to us, although it's something that we don't want to happen to us. We just couldn't help it all. But rescuing the flying enterprise was to be more difficult. There were some 15 ships in the western approaches clamoring for help, but there were only three ocean-going large rescue tugs available. The Dutch tug Zwarte Zee was recovering another ship. Her sister tug Ocean was therefore hastily engaged. Unfortunately, Zwarte Zee got into trouble, colliding with another ship and Oceane had to go to her rescue. This left just the British tug, Turmoil, which was towing a vessel to Falmouth. She agreed to help once she had completed this. It would be three or four days before she could reach the stricken flying enterprise. The story of the flying enterprise will continue in a... Undercover missions. Elaborate webs of deception and propaganda. But now researchers are breaking into the past and into the decades of silence. Secrets of World War II. Tonight at 11 Eastern, 12 Pacific on the History Channel. Now back to Captain Carlson and the sinking of the Flying Enterprise. On the 2nd of January, 1952, the American destroyer Weeks took over the escort of the debilitated ship Flying Enterprise. Concerned about Captain Carlson, Weeks' captain tried to persuade him to abandon the Flying Enterprise to the greater comfort of his ship. But Carlson was more worried about his ship's papers. Okay, Golden Eagle, I'm now ready to throw my life jacket with the papers in. The papers are in a watertight container. I know, Captain, as soon as you get those papers, I wish you would open them up and see if they're dry. If they're okay, just put them in your safe, please. The crew now prepared to transfer hot coffee, sandwiches, and reading material to Carlson. They did this by firing a line across. Carlson, who had been subsisting on just cake and tea made by boiling water over a candle, was deeply grateful. In the meantime, Southland had now arrived at the Dutch port of Rotterdam and landed Flying Enterprises, passengers and crew whom she had rescued. With the barometer now falling once more, a cable from Hans Isbranson, owner of the Flying Enterprise, told Carlson to put his own safety ahead of that of the ship, which, under salvage laws, he could now abandon, as a rescue had been organized. Carlson replied that he would stay with the vessel until she reached port or sank. The tugboat turmoil was now on her way, but her crew was very tired. She eventually reached the Flying Enterprise late on the 3rd of January amid rising seas. The tug skipper Dan Parker realized that no time could be lost. He told Carlson that since the Flying Enterprise was down by the bows, he would tow her stern first. Carlson would have to catch and secure the messenger line on his own since it was too dangerous to try to put a member of the tug's crew aboard. But the tow line kept breaking as the wind and waves forced the two vessels apart. Parker therefore tried to secure the tow line to the bows, but again without success. While Carlson rested in his radio cabin, the tug rigged fresh gear and came in again. Suddenly, the vessels touched. And in an instinctive impulse, Turmoil's mate, Kenneth Dancy, leaped aboard Flying Enterprise. 
the morning of Saturday the 5th of January revealed an improvement in the weather. In spite of the presence of persistent drizzle and fog, the tow was finally secured and Dancy elected to remain with Carlson. Parker now set course for Falmouth, 350 miles away. He knew that the voyage would be difficult. Even in the calmest seas, they would be unable to steam at more than four knots. There was, too, the ever-present danger that flying Enterprise might well capsize unless he was very careful. Throughout Sunday and Monday, they edged ever closer to Falmouth, with the American destroyer following close at hand. In Falmouth, excitement was beginning to mount. The world's press were gathering in the little port. Preparations were also being made to give Carlson and the crew of Turmoil a hero's welcome. All now depended on the weather. King Frederick of Denmark sent a personal telegram to Carlson via the Danish naval attaché in London. Carlson's parents were flown in from Copenhagen in order to greet their son on his arrival in port. Vessels set out to give personal encouragement to Carlson and the turmoil, while numerous aircraft circled above them. But on Tuesday afternoon, the wind freshened considerably to almost gale force. Captain Parker headed for the Scilly Isles in order to ride it out. Late that night, the weather moderated and turmoil was once more able to take the strain. But the waiting crowds now heard bad news. The tow had snapped. It was still dark, however, and nothing could be done until daybreak. When this came, Carlson and Dancy crawled out to inspect the damage. They found a buckled quick-release shackle, which would have to be cut free before the tow could be re-secured. Drenched by the sea, and with only a hacksaw blade to work with, it took some three hours to free the shackle. By then, the sea was too rough to secure another tow, and so they retreated to the cabin to dry off. A newsreel reporter sent this account from an aircraft overhead. There is no tow rope on board. The sea is breaking right across her deck, as, as her deck as it uh, slants, of course, steeply up from the water. I do not see how anybody could be out on that deck. I do not see at the moment how any tow line could be got aboard because I, do not, uh, I don't see how anyone could be on the deck to take the tow line. The flying Enterprise began to settle deeper in the water. This forced the two men to abandon the radio shack for Carlson's own cabin, which stood high on the starboard side. The gale continued unabated that night and the following morning, Thursday. The rescuers' hopes began to fade. Now, back to Captain Carlson and the sinking of the flying Enterprise. The British tugboat Turmoil and the American destroyer Willard Keith, which had replaced the Weeks, urged Captain Carlson and Kenneth Dancy to abandon the flying enterprise since it was still impossible to secure the tow. But they still hoped that conditions would improve and that they could reach Falmouth before nightfall. But Carlson was becoming worried about his ship. The creakings and vibrations in her hull had an increasingly ominous sound. A helicopter from the Royal Naval Air Station at Culdrose now took off at the request of Willard Keith's captain. The wind was very strong, but eventually the helicopter was picked up on Willard Keith's radar just seven miles away. At that moment, Carlson radioed that his ship was about to go down. 
he and Dancy were seen scrambling down the side of the superstructure. But now the helicopter pilot radioed Willard Keith that he had reached the limit of his endurance and would have to turn back. The destroyer's captain told Turmoil that she would have to go in and rescue the two men. The flying Enterprise had now listed to over 90 degrees and the sea was pouring into her funnel. Turmoil now closed in. The nearest shore station radioed. Taking full distress action. We are taking full distress action. Willard Keith radioed the shore. This is a Keith, uh, Roger. There are plenty of ships standing by to take Captain Carlson and Mr. Dancy off. We can see them both standing on the Flying Enterprise now. Over. At that moment, Carlson and Dancy, both in life jackets, waved the turmoil, walked along the now horizontal funnel, and then jumped hand in hand into the sea, which was now littered with the remnants of Flying Enterprise's cargo and other debris. came a welcome message. Now this is the Willard Keith. Uh, turmoil has rescued Captain Carlson and Mr. Dancy. Both safely aboard. Over. As the flying Enterprise continued her dying struggles, Turmoil's crew gave Carlson and Dancy dry clothing and a hot drink. The two men then went up on deck once more to witness the last minutes of the flying Enterprise. Gradually, the ocean took hold of her. Yet she still seemed to resist the ever-tightening watery grip in which she found herself. Watching a ship sink is poignant at any time, but for the crew of the turmoil it was sadder than most, given their efforts to save her. For Carlson it was even harder, since it was his ship which was going down. Indeed, after a time, Carlson could not bear to watch any longer and was led below. More and more of the flying Enterprise vanished beneath the surface. Finally, her bows briefly rose as if she were giving a farewell salute. She then disappeared from view and sank to her last resting place on the seabed. Her long agony was finally at an end. At Falmouth, a large but subdued crowd were waiting to greet the turmoil. Among those present were Carlson's parents. Turmoil was escorted to the dock. Carlson and her crew disembarked. The town's mayor presided over the welcome. It has fallen to the lot of this ancient seaport to welcome into it on their return from the hazards and perils of the sea 
this company of very brave men. Captain Parker of the turmoil was modest about the part he played. Of course, as you are aware, this is to us just an ordinary job. Then it was the turn of Carlson's gallant companion, Kenneth Dancy. I'm afraid I'm really too overwhelmed to say very much, but uh, I must uh, express my great admiration for Captain Carlson and uh, Captain Parker and all hands as they come turmoil. Finally, Kurt Carlson was able to acknowledge all who had stood by him. I knew Captain Parker and his crew lived up to the tradition of an old seafaring nation, and this. I believe what was possible to save the flying enterprise. I deeply regret that I was not in a position to bring it back with me, but the odds were too heavy against us. Once again, your worship, thanks for the welcome, and I wish you sincerely to convey my most sincere thanks to all those who were behind me. Thank you. As Carlson now made his way through the streets of Falmouth, the townspeople turned out en masse to pay tribute to his courage. But this was nothing to what he experienced when he finally arrived back in New York. The city gave him a welcome that was reserved for the famous. President Harry S. Truman personally congratulated Carlson at a banquet, where he also received a medal for his bravery. But Carlson himself was essentially a quiet and private man, and the adulation rendered to him meant little compared with the way in which his shipping company rewarded him. American exportist Bronson gave him a brand new ship, it was the best present he could have had. Kurt Carlson and the Flying Enterprise are now enshrined in maritime history. Their story is a lasting tribute to the endurance of ships and those who sail them. Coming up next, the BMW, a powerful machine, no doubt about it. But how did it become such a status symbol? Hitch a ride on automobiles and get the story behind the image. And all this week, History Alive brings you an all-new series, Arms in Action. The story of spear, sword, gun, armor, and fortress defense. Don't miss the superb recreations of battles supervised by Britain's famed Royal Armories. At 9 Eastern, 10 Pacific here on the History Channel, where the past comes alive. <laughs>